Hey, what's up, guys? It is Dion Brown, and you are watching Man vs. Brand. <laughs> um, you're watching Man vs. Brand. And you know what I love? I love uh, so much about um, this podcast platform, specifically like this virtual one, because in essence, um, there's a space where everyone is connected. We're all together. We're all having conversation. It's also one where just you know, crazy things are happening. Um, last, I think last episode, you guys will hear, I said something that triggered my um, device. I won't call her by name, right? She answered a question that we couldn't figure out during the episode. And I love when like little quirky stuff like that happens because it really does um, create a sense of, of these conversations really being organic um, and interesting and fun and unexpected. Now, Let's talk about what we're gonna talk about today in part. Parenting is difficult. Uh, and it's not just difficult for human beings. It's difficult all throughout nature. And nature's job is to figure out how to not only uh, survive and preserve their own life, but also to hopefully procreate and continue on their species. Now, that's not to say that uh, anyone who chooses to not engage in that activity or do not have the capacity to engage in that activity is any less of a human being, it robs them uh, nothing of their personhood and their agency and their choice. Because we also know that parenting oftentimes is not biological. Parenting comes in the form of many different people. Um, I lost my parents when I was uh, in my preteens, and um, I list the people who are parents to me, um, and a lot of them were not directly related to me. They were people that invested time, resources, energy, lessons into developing me and others like me into the best human beings possible. Now, that doesn't mean, like in nature, that that's inherent. That there is just this moment where you see this bundle of joy, angst, anxiety. There's a spectrum. Not everyone feels joy when they first see their baby. Let's be clear about that. That's okay. That's okay. Right? We're not gonna we're not gonna rob people of the fact that they get to feel whatever emotion they feel in that moment. Um, you you see this thing. And then all of a sudden, um, you have community, you have understanding, you have clarity, you have timeline. Some of this is just not, a lot of it isn't just um, natural. And I think what, what I love about um, where we are in the world right now is that we're, we're starting to understand um, how things like gender roles have started to make us feel as if this person should have this skill. This person should already understand this inherently. And it's not until that I, I think we build community that we really understand the full spectrum of experience as it relates to parenthood. And we understand that the feelings that we have, uh, regardless of what they are, are not meant or should not be meant um, for us to then translate into shame or fear, but really allow us to advocate for who we are and what we wanna do, and then have a community, have leadership, have thinkers, feelers, empathizers, sympathizers to support us in that journey. Cause we're not gonna all get it right, but hopefully we get enough of it right mm -hmm. that we don't, you know, um, we don't, we don't leave this earth feeling like, man, I shouldn't have dropped that kid off at the church and left. No, okay. that was the thing back in the day. For all you people that are like millennials, people used to drop kids off at the church and they didn't want them. Anyway, so this is um, Man versus Brand. I'm talking to Bridget Daly. Uh, she runs Parent in Biz. Dot UK, right? Yep. 
<laughs> yep, .co.uk or .com. Yep. I've got both. <laughs> okay, cool. .com, right? Um, yeah. She uh, not only comes with a wealth of experience, but a story that led her to the, the moment in which um, she, like children, birthed something that is now taking shape, that is now forming and in which is growing to be its own entity. And that's what we want for our kids, right? For them to grow and to become their own entity and to flourish um, in the hands of others, right? Whether those are teachers, whomever. So if you're interested in learning about this from a guy who has no kids, uh, talking about what it is to be a parent, then this is gonna be the episode for you. All right, we're gonna start this right now. Bridget, what's going on? Hi, thank you for having me on. <laughs> Absolutely, glad, glad to have you on. Um, so talk to me, um, what, what kind of got you um, in the space of, of creating content uh, specifically around parenting? Well, I'll give you a bit backdrop to my background. Um, I'm a mother of five. Um, I had my children quite young. So by the age of 21, I had three children. I had my first child at 16. Um, I started off in accountancy. I then went on to work in the social care sector. Um, towards the end of like studying, because I went back to, at a later age to do a degree, um, once I had completed my degree, it was like, okay, I had a choice of work or becoming an entrepreneur. I always had that kind of spirit in me where I wanted to have my own kind of business. Um, I wanted to work for myself. So I thought, okay, um, I was with my partner at that time and we set up a telecommunications business to start with. Um, and wait, from wait, that, that, that track, because that, that I might be a telecommunication business. Yeah, telecommunications business. It was and, my and very what, first business. And what did that look like? And what that looked like, it was um, it was reselling numbers. So we'd get numbers and then we'd resell them. So it was just something that we I, we stumbled across that and then we kind of like turned it into a thing. And then we decided with the money from that, how about we set up something new and we set up a woman's e-commerce fashion site. And it was during this time when we set up, we set up that and then I ended up pregnant with my my youngest child um which is my last child <laughs> and um we set that up and it was during running this business because my partner was working at the time and I was more at home running the business because it was a startup so you know it didn't require two of us we weren't bringing enough money for two of us to work on it yeah. and I felt so lonely and isolated um and I was just like you know are there any other parents or mothers out there who are running businesses like me who feel like me, you know, want someone to bounce off ideas off against and, you know, just that type of thing where you can talk parenting, but you can also talk business as well. So I came up with the concept in 2015 for Parents in Biz. And then I launched it in 2017 um, when we decided to close down our women's e-commerce e website. And then when I set up Parents in Biz, um, I didn't want to just focus on mumpreneurs because that's where a lot of the focus was. I wanted to include dads as well. And then it just kind of like grew its own legs. Um, I started off with a podcast interviewing parents um, about their businesses and their journeys and just sharing it with the kind of audience. And then I came up with the idea for the Parents in Business magazine. So that's, yeah, that's very much how it started. <laughs> so talk to me because we're, we're, you're, we're on a podcast, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, and the audience for this podcast is mostly in the States, yeah. right? Not quite global. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, do you find that that the content that you're producing for parents in biz um is quite global or do you find it to be sort of segmented specifically um for maybe like a british audience or people that sort of um that that are situated 
around that sort of um, British experience? Well, <laughs> when I initially started, it was very targeted for UK. Yeah. Um, and then like when I was podcasting, I realized, okay, you know, when you look at your statistics and you're like, oh, getting listeners from over there and over here and over there <laughs> kind yeah. of thing. And then when I launched the magazine, because the magazine is available in digital and print and it's on various digital platforms, I then started to realize, okay, this is global because I get parents from the States reading the magazine, from Australia, New Zealand, all over reading the magazine. And the first realization of that was when um, a parent that was in the States, for example, said, oh, I was, I think she said she was in the library and she she saw my magazine and I was like, wow, how did my magazine get there <laughs> kind of thing? Because I I know I, sh I had shipped to this, like shipped magazines to the States, but it was just like, okay, this is actually all different like audiences I'm actually getting, I'm getting a global audience. So I had to kind of change the way my content is being delivered because it was very UK focused. I have to now, which is moving on into the future, like 2023, I have to now think of it more on a broad, broader spectrum of, you know, how it fits in with an Australian audience. And there's there's parents in biz in Australia and there's parents in biz in the States, for example. So now I interview parents that are based all around the world so that you're hearing inspirational stories from parents that are in New, New Zealand, well, New Zealand or Australia, where their experience is different to a parent that's in the UK, and that makes it even more interesting for the reader as well. Absolutely. Uh, uh, on that note of just um, parents in business um, having um, shared and diverse global experiences. Um, how how did you approach the pandemic in your content when parents were doubling down on parenting in a many places while also trying to figure out how to grow their business in a space where you know um unless you were like amazon <laughs> um you know you know it was it was it was, it was really like you know how do I approach people? What type of emails do I send out? You know, what type of care calls do I do? Right. Because people are trying to get their business done, but we're also aware that death and sickness and illness was also simultaneously happening on a global scale. So what was your content like during that time frame? So I imagine um, you had to make some choices. Yeah, I had to make choices um, because I also had to make choices for myself because I was homeschooling myself. <laughs> so I also had less time to focus on my business. So it was like I was homeschooling two of my younger children at that point at home. And I decided, OK, um, I was on social media a lot less than I was before. And what I did was during that time, it was putting together resources and sharing other people's resources on how to manage one, the juggle of juggling parenting and running your business at that time, and also resources to accessing finance as well, because that was the other knock on effect of the pandemic was, you know, um, you're not bringing in the money you used to bring in. And a lot of self-employed parents were having their um, contracts that they had were, were coming to an end, you know, um, people were ending it because the work could not be done because of the pandemic. So um, those, yeah, it was those kind of resources that I kind of focused my content that way. In terms of the magazine, we kind of focused the content on getting through parents through what they were experiencing at that time. So I think I did a special feature that time on how other parents were managing um, during that time as well with their comments on what they were doing. And then now, as we're like in this economic crisis that we're going through, um, with the cost of living rising, interest rates rising, um, the magazine's focusing on how to market during that time, um, how to finish the year strong, you know, and go into 20. 23 on a solid foundation where you can start to you know build your business grow your business still even though 
people are facing hardship and people are thinking twice about what to spend their money on, you know. Um, so it's really kind of like keeping my ear to the ground, what's going on in the news, um, what's going to affect business owners, and as well as what is going to affect parents. So it's kind of like twofold, you know, if schools are closing, okay, this is going to have a knock on on parents. So it's, yeah. All right, <laughs> cool. Um, so in, in a way, the uh, the information is timely and relevant to what's going on. Let's mm -hmm. let's talk about age now, right? So you started your parenting journey at sixteen. Yeah. Right? <laughs> um, is there a segment of of your content that specifically speaks to a younger um, parent who may not necessarily kind of understand what their life path is going to look like, where entrepreneurship may be a part of their possible journey? Right. So in relation to that, I do, because teenage pregnancy is something that's very close to me and very personal to me, I do, like, I've given talks on it. Um, I, intend, I attend anything where young people are, where I can talk from my experience, Um and how, you know, at, at that age, when you do become a teen, a teen parent, you do actually think, oh, my gosh, it's the end of the world. I have no future. There's nothing left for me, <laughs> you know, um, but you do have a future and you can you can you can get over it. You can go on to achieve things. It, just that it's your journey is going to look very different from your friend who didn't have a child, for example. And your journey is going to be a bit tougher. You know, let's face it, it is tougher when you do have children. And um, I always share my journey um, where, wherever I can. I've shared it in newspapers. I've always sh shared my journey. Um, in terms of content, the content that is on the platform and in the magazine appeals to all ages. So that's why there's quite a broad um, spectrum of readers in the age of the readership. So I think it just kind of appeals to anyone who is a parent, who's in business, who is facing, you know, there's startups, I have, you know, features on startups. So even if it's a parent who's starting up, they'll share their experience. That will appeal to a younger parent who might be thinking of starting a business as well. So the content is very appealing to all various different ages. It is as well, as well as the older parent, because now as I've moved on to this next phase in life, I call it, where I've got four adult children now and my youngest is like um, 12, going to be 12 soon. I'm more in a do my my challenges and my juggle is totally different to that of a parent who's got three children under the age of 10, for example. So, you know, yeah, I'm always sharing stuff. <laughs> well, yeah, that was even my next question because there there is a um a segment of parents who are empty nesters who uh, whose children are adults, they moved out of the home and now their life has been partly consumed with raising these children and the children no longer need them in the same way, right? And so that person has a lot of time on their hands um, and, and trying to figure out what to do with the rest of their life, right? And so in a way, they're still a parent, yet um, there's still um, some opportunity for them to grow businesses. Yeah, yeah. And it just looks different for them. That's all it is, is it just looks a bit different, like, my time, my, my, my time being a parent, like when I first started out, for example, to my time now is just totally different. Now I've got so much more time to focus on growing my business, developing new ideas in my business because my children don't need me as much. They still need me, you know, but not as much as they needed me when they were younger. Got it. So, um, so your 16-year-old self is, is, is looking at the prospects of your life, right? Your 20, when did you say you had your last child, 20? Oh, no, I had, by the age of 21, I had three children. Yeah, but when did you have your last one? Oh, my last child, she's 12, so I had her 12 years ago. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm just trying to figure out the range of age. So 16. So oh, so, so, so my oldest is 29. 
Okay. And then I've got a 27-year-old, a 25-year-old, and an 18-year-old, and a 12-year-old. And it, okay. soon to be 12. <laughs> so, so your your first child when you were 16, yeah, isn't the same age as you, but they're paralleling in maybe some life experiences. Yeah, I would imagine, right? So, what do they think about? what you're producing in terms of content as a nearly 30 year old person compared to maybe your 18 year old who may, you know, that just may not even be on their radar. Right. So how has readership been for your children considering that your oldest is at a point where most young people are really kind of uh, digging into entrepreneurship and what that looks like, even though that he may not be a, or the person may not be a parent. Um, it's still some interesting information around the development and proliferation of a business. Well, um, my children are fully supportive of what I, what I do. Um, because what I should add as well is during my business journey, because I've been in, journey, in business over 12 years now, they've all gone through the different stages of childhood development during my journey so for example my oldest when I first started off in business he was in his teens so they've always seen me working for myself although through some of my journey I have been in employment when things have got tough when the money weren't coming in you go back to employment and get some money you know um so in terms of that they've, they've always been supportive um um, yeah, in terms of, yeah, they've always been supportive. What was the question again? The question is, do they read it? Do they do like? Do they read it? Oh, uh, yeah, I, I'm always showing it off to them. The youngest might not, might not. That just might not be their thing at this moment of their life. Yeah. But like your oldest, like, are they just like reading it just to sort of see not only what you're producing, but you know, they're at an age where this is like a reality. If this is what you want to do. Okay. Well, they read it because I've produced it. But as for them being entrepreneurs, they're not interested. <laughs> right. cool. I cool. think I've actually put them off, to be honest, because they say I work so hard and I think they think, okay, in employment's easier because my mum works far too hard. So yeah, I think I've actually put my children off becoming entrepreneurs because I'm very dedicated to what I do. And, right. you know, I will work, if, if, if I don't get to do it in the day, I will work at night time, you know, to get what I need to get done. So they've always seen me kind of like working hard and I think they thought, oh, nine to five looks a bit easier. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so have you done any of, of your uh, uh, parent meetups? Like, have you ever had like a- Yeah, I've done, I've done, um, I've done events. Um, I've done online events as well. Um, because after the pandemic, it kind of moved to like, you know, during, I should say, and afterwards, it was very much Zoom meetups, Zoom meetings, networking events. Before that, I did do some in-person events. Um, I've kind of moved away from that at the moment um, for a number of reasons. It's because I want to take parents and biz in a bit of a different direction for 2023. Um because it's all about supporting the parent who's in business and it's all about shouting about their business and, you know, celebrating their businesses and promoting them as much as I can and build, you know, giving them awareness, of, you know, business awareness for their business. But for the future, the way I'm looking at it in the future is to kind of um, take it in a bit of a different direction, less focus on events and networking and um, more focus on, the podcast, the magazine, the website is going to get um, redone and focus on content that can support them. So more resources. That sounds amazing. What I actually was going to ask, though, is mm. uh, what was the feedback when you met someone in person? Right. Because you, you're putting out this content. You've never <laughs> seen this person before. You're at a meetup and you have possibly changed the course of their life. Right, like, um, what was the first? <laughs> what was the first experience where you met someone that was a reader, subscriber of your content, and it really dawned on you how much of a positive effect you were having in their life? Um, I think it 
dawned on me is when I attended a networking event and I, I, I didn't host it, I went to one and I said what I did. And then, you know, the first thing is when you say you're a mother of five, people think, well, how do you do it? Kind of thing, right? You know, five kids. So they always have, the question I always get asked first is like, how do you manage it all? That's the question I get asked the most. Um, and then like, how did you start the magazine is the second question I always get asked. And um, it was it was the love from in the room of when it was my turn to talk about my business and what I did and what I had produced, which was the magazine, and I gave out copies. And it was just the enthusiasm of everyone that was in the room. And, you know, even people who weren't parents were like, can I get involved in this? This is amazing. And that, just those little things, and the little messages I get, like, you know, emails, it could be a DM or anything, just saying, oh, my God, this magazine, you know, so useful, so resourceful. How can I get involved? Is there anything you need from me? I'm a subscriber. Those, just those messages are everything. It just makes me know I'm making that little bit of difference. That's awesome. Yeah, for me, um, I did a, uh, a mental health awareness talk for for a month for mental health awareness month out here in the states and um it was because a friend of mine committed suicide and i just felt like i needed to do the work and yeah. um i was walking in the street and this is just a, a, an audio podcast was walking in the street and i was talking to someone and someone was like i know your voice and i was like uh possibly right and they're like um i was in a dark place and i listened to you for three weeks and I finally was able to come outside. And I, and I never, especially in the beginning of this, never really looked at my numbers. I just kind of was like, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna wait because sometimes you become so number centric in the beginning that you start to make decisions that aren't really natural to the progression of your business, to the life cycle of your business. Like, oh, these people like it, or this time they like it, or this time they're at this moment they're watching it or listening to it. And therefore I should change everything that I'm doing to suit that. It was in that moment I was just like, oh, even if I did this for the next 15 years and this was the one person that I met, right, yeah. then it, it changed everything. Because yeah. I imagine, like, you know, like, so much of this can be in, in, in like you said, about your e-commerce business, in, an isolated kind of segmented part of your life, right? You're, you're sort of doing this thing and... You're not necessarily getting a lot of feedback. Um, you're making decisions and uh, you put it out into the universe and you you hope to get a sale, a like, a transaction, a subscription, mm -hmm. hope something happens from it. But even then, those are just really numbers or messages or likes, right? It's not until yeah. I think you see at, from one human being to another human being that yeah. what you've done has actually affected their life that you really go, Oh, this feels purpose driven, right? Like it's yeah. not just I came up with a really cool idea, but this idea has created impact. And so we wanted to hear a bit about kind of your experience with that. Cause I imagine you're supporting and helping parents all throughout the world. And therefore, um, they are grateful for the work that you are doing to help them be their best self. Yeah. And you know, just touching upon exactly what you what you've just said, it's it's so true because I come from like a counselling social care background because I'm a qualified counsellor. And when I did start Parents in Biz, it was, it did fulfil that part of me where I felt like I was helping and I'm making a difference. So like a, a prime example, and it always sticks in my memory is when I was counselling, I was counselling a child because I did child ch children counselling, sorry. And I did like, you know, art therapy with her and everything. And, you know, she sent me the card. She gave me a card afterwards. And she said, you've really made a difference. Um, I really don't want to leave because it was very difficult ending like the sessions with her. And that always sticks with me. I've still got it. I've still got the card and everything she's written it to this day. She's probably an adult now. <laughs> but that's what I feel like my purpose is with parents in biz it's supporting parents and helping parents through this challenge through, ch through challenge the challenging time of being a parent because the journey of parenthood is just challenging from 
the moment you have them till when they're in adulthood, it's it's a challenge and it's a journey. And if I can do one one thing for them or make a difference in their life, in whether it's their life or their business, that makes me happy. And like you said, don't get focused on the numbers because it's so easy to get focused on the numbers. Um, but when you do it with a purpose, the numbers don't matter. Yeah, and the numbers will come. Like if you're consistent yeah. and you do the yeah. work and you're you're not, I think if you're not numbers driven in the beginning and you find your voice, you find your tone, then when you start looking at the numbers, you have, you understand your mission, you understand a bit of your business, and then you can start to let the numbers inform you of opportunity and places maybe that you can pivot as opposed to, um, which I see a lot of people, um, it, it dissuades them from continuing, right? The numbers can dissuade you from moving forward before your business has even gotten to the point that it's healthy and viable. So you're like, I only got five likes, only got, wait it out, it's okay. Yeah. No, All right, it's so you know. true. It's so yeah. true. <laughs> because even when I started up the magazine for the first year, when I launched the magazine, I self-funded it for the first year because I don't come from an editorial background. I don't come from a publishing background. I just came up with the idea and decided to run with it. Um, so it was very much collaboration with parents within the community, community who helped me with the content, um, allowed me to interview them and everything. So for the first year, I wasn't fixated on numbers or anything because I was doing it for love, uh, because I was self-funding it as well. <laughs> so there was no monetary gain from it. Yeah. But yeah, after the first year, I had to, you know, yeah. monetize it because yeah. i couldn't afford yeah. to yeah. grow yeah right yeah. Um, yeah but um but yeah like giving it you know space to kind of breathe and live right because ultimately and, and to anyone who's watching listening ultimately what 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 you may not see in volume you may see in super advocates like you yeah. really just need 40 people who will tell thousands of people about you than to find thousands of people yourself. Like so many people want that you want, a lot of folks want their the byproduct of their work to produce numbers for them, right? When oftentimes you just need other people that will advocate for you in such a way that the numbers come to you because you're working in a network of people who love, appreciate and support heavily into your business. And when you yeah. find those people, keep them close, love them dearly, um, yeah. engage with them, because there are some people that, you know, you may, again, you may only have 40 people following you, but all you need is that one. Yeah. That well, one who has 2,000 people following them to yeah. share your thing, and now all of a sudden you're at 5,000, and you went yeah. from 40, but if you only focus on the 40, then you may, you may become dissuaded from doing the work that you need to do. Sometimes you just need to find that one person that really believes in you, that will get you over the hump and really start to, to, to help you grow your business. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And it's also just nurturing your audience as well, isn't it? It's, you know, whether if you've got an email list or, you know, if you're a regular on social media, I'm not as regular as I used to be on social media at all, but um, with my email list, I do keep them up to date in what's actually happening in my life and the way I'm taking, you know, the way forward I'm taking parents in biz. So, yeah, it's nurturing those. And, you know, you always have your avid supporters as well. There's always a few that stand out and they're always there shouting you on all the time. And I do have those supporters. And sometimes I could be having a bad day and I don't know if it's the universe giving it back to me, but they'll pop in my inbox with a message and I'll be like, oh my gosh, I really needed that today. You made such a difference, but they don't realize they've made such a difference by that message that's just uplifted you. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's also, I think, because you're right, it's the universe, right? Because what, what, what it does is in some form of, and people will call it karma, people will call it whatever it is, but in, in some reciprocity, the energy that, the thing that you give out to the world that a person sees, hears, or receives when they need it, the world then reciprocates the same to you, right? Yeah. So as you're putting out stuff and you're like, I, you, 
I don't even know if this is going to have an effect, right? It's affecting others' lives. And someone's sending you an email and it's just like, I'm not doing this because I know you're in this space. I'm just mm -hmm. sending it out because mm -hmm. you yeah. have this moment and it changes your life, right? So, so we're mm -hmm. all sort of moving in spaces where our output is is hopefully matching our input and and some of it will be hopefully financial um a lot of it will hopefully be resource and opportunity um and and then a bit of it will also just be um emotional investment just like yeah it it feels good to keep doing this because some days running a business you just it's like man i, I can be doing anything i can be so <laughs> I can be sleep right now, right? Like I can be doing anything at home. Um, and sleep becomes the premium. Listen, entrepreneur, sleep becomes the premium. There's yeah. moments where I'm like, when was the last time I slept? Right? Yeah. But, but yeah. you can become so invested in what you're doing that you know, um, just making sure that you find space for those moments. So I have a question for you. Yeah. Uh, it's it's not related to the um to the website to the um to the magazine uh but i think it's an interesting question to ask someone who is in the parenting space who also worked with children so um is 18 the right breakoff point for a child like do you believe are you uh, in the 18 category the 21 category or the 25 category. Because different people have these sort of different ideas, right? Some people are like 18, you're out, you're an adult, you're on your own, figure it out, I'm here to support you. I'm like, hey, I have to live for like a month, but get it together. Some people are like, get through college, right? My, my job is to get you through college. Once you're through college, you're good. Then there's another subset of people that's like, listen, you're gonna mess up your credit from 21 to 25. I'm just gonna be here to help you not do that. So by the time you leave my house, <laughs> get your own house or get your own apartment, save up money, work, get your own stuff, then get out of here and never come back, right? So, so where do you see yourself in the spectrum? Because so many different people have different ideas about um, when, not when their parenthood should end, because I think that's a lifelong endeavor, but when yeah. they're like, when their day-to-day resource absorbing responsibility to their child <laughs> is, I, is so that's a great question because my children um my children moved out about oh uh, gosh just over about about a, about a year and a half ago okay so before that um we were a family of seven um, and then the three adults, the three or three of the adults, I should say, the three older ones, they yeah. moved out. Um, so I allowed, I, uh, my approach is a bit different because with my children, I never ever said, oh, you have to move out. You have to go and find your footing. My thing was, is you can stay at home as long as you need to save. So you can either buy a property, but where you can get the best possible footing. So, for example, one of them, two of them saved, one didn't save, <laughs> you know, one likes the party life and likes to enjoy her life. So um, I gave them that I gave them that option. So in terms of it depends as well. It depends if you are 18, like my 18 year old now, he's going to university. So he will still get my support because he's going on to further education. Now, in my opinion, once you leave further education, right, that's when reality really hits. You've got to find a job because you've got your student loan to pay back and you've got responsibilities. You know, you've got to, you know, you're out in the big wild world now because you've got all your education and it's time for you to, to do something with it. So it really does vary. And I think it varies from child to child as well. So, yeah, <laughs> it really does vary from child to child. So for you, there isn't a cutoff point. It's about... Um, your interpersonal relationship with your child and understanding um, yeah. how they'll approach possibly the next few years of your life and then um, of their life and then determining yeah. maybe what your best advice would for them would be. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's you, you know, it's it's like a case by case basis, isn't it? Some, you know, some children can't wait to get out at the, you know, move out at the age of eighteen, and then some are quite happy to be at home or to even go on to further education. Not all of my children have gone on to like university, you know. Some of them have just gone straight into work. So, it's yeah, yeah, it's a case by case basis. But even when they move out, they still need you. <laughs> So as an entrepreneur, how do you feel about higher education? How do I feel? Well, oh, I think it's useful. I, I'm for higher education because I do believe a lot of the education I got when I did my degree, for example, has played out in my business. Um, so my degree covered things like marketing it co covered um you know behavior how you know how people behave the psychology aspect of things and i do feel that has helped me in a lot of um decisions i make a lot of content that i produce and i also think it gives you that structure because at university you've got deadlines don't you and i think it's those deadlines that you get through education where you know you've got to hit a deadline that when you've got when you're in business and you've got a deadline to hit you're 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 serious because you know what the deadline is you've got the experience through the education system so it's not a necessity but i do say it does help it does help i don't know I, i'm sort of on the fence i, I, I started mm. coming on the fence guy um yeah uh, i think I've, I've now worked within a lot of cultures that people go directly into um the workforce specifically starting their own businesses and with the idea that they're going to use the and, and you know the states and other countries where you have to i don't really know how the, the pay structure of um the university system but they're like i'd rather take the 80 90 thousand dollars that i was going to spend for four years and start my business with it um yeah. and work the next four years for my business but i always tell them college taught at least for me four things that i don't necessarily know that you need college for because i think if you're truly going to move into being an entrepreneur you're probably going to create opportunity anyway right so you're probably mm -hmm. you're just going to find your way right but college teaches you how to have a long-term goal for completion it teaches you how to um rely on resources that uh, may not be apparent to you. Like, you know, do you go to study groups? Do you, you know, are you working with the TA? Like, are you talking to people? Are you saying that you need help? Or are you just waiting for someone to come to you to ask you if you're okay? Because in high school, people ask you if you're okay. In college, if you don't say nothing, <laughs> Everyone's just like, I hope it works out, right? Yeah. Uh, it teaches you um, networking, right? Because yeah. some of these people may be the people that are in the rest of your life. So how do you choose the right people? In high school, we just tend to all just, the, the class is the class and the school is the school. In college, people tend to be a bit more self-identifying. They have more agency. And so friendships and relationships are choices, not necessarily just, I got sat next to you. So now yeah. we're going to be friends. And, and lastly, it's the diversity of it all, right? Like you can come in saying, I want to do math and leave being like, I love art. You can come in and say, I want to do, you know, um, biology and leave saying, man, uh, clinical psychology is something I really want to do, right? Mm -hmm. So when you're an entrepreneur, it's like, if you're not curious about the world, if you're not reading a lot, if you're not networking a lot, if you don't, if you're ba really bad with long-term goals, and if you don't advocate for, I need a sale, I need you to get this service, I need support, you should probably go to college. Because yeah. <laughs> you probably go to college, learn those things, wait the four years, and then try this again. Because yeah. if, without those skills, um, this this game becomes really hard. Uh, mm -hmm. If you don't know how to ask for business, it becomes really hard. If you don't like to network really hard, if you can't see your business, if you can't imagine a version of your business four years from now and work every day toward that four-year mark, it's going to be really hard for you. Mm -hmm. um, and so college, I think, teaches so much of those valuable skill sets. And it also gives you a degree and teaches you about yeah. 
um, um, practical skills, right? But um, I think there's also that kind of larger context to college that like when you do it right, you're like, oh, I need funding. Oh, my high school, I mean, my freshman roommate went into mm-hmm. finance, let me call them, right? Yeah. Versus, you know, mm-hmm. let, me, let me go on LinkedIn and find someone new to talk to, right? So if you yeah. use that, if you, if you spend your time while you're young leveraging people yeah. and creating real bonds with them, I think it really does pay off in your future business. Mm-hmm. No, it's true. and it depends what kind of business you want to set up. Like, for example, my partner's an accountant, and he had to get the educate. He had to go and get qualifications for that in order to say, okay, I'm going to work for myself and set up my own accountancy practice. So he wouldn't have been able to do that without the education. Do you see what I mean? So it just depends what kind of business you decide you want to set up as well, doesn't it? Except out here, you could just you could literally just go. And get a CPA license, and you're all of a sudden an accountant. Oh, oh wow! Okay, <laughs> yeah, like it's a pretty intense test. But yeah, yeah, like you know, you yeah, um, be, there are very few um like um uh doctors here can do plastic surgery. You don't necessarily, or they can do forms of plastic surgery. Um, they don't mm-hmm. have to be a plastic surgeon. Um, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Dentists can do things that are considered broader medical stuff. Um, yeah. Lawyers automatically become real estate agents because they understand law. Um, okay. But yeah, you don't have to go to You can get your CPA license and boom, you're now uh, a, a certified accountant. Um, wow. So here, yeah, <laughs> over here, accountants are certified. So yeah. you can either take the course and do it the long way, or you can do it the short way. But to your point, you're right, right? Like yeah. if you're if you're gonna enter into something specialized, like you can't have your own law practice and or dental practice and not have done the time to actually have attained the degrees in order to be that yeah yeah you can fund it you can be Mm -hmm. a a silent partner in it right but to be an owner and operator of it you will absolutely need to do the entire spectrum of work to get you to the point where you're accredited and respected. And, yeah. and in that way, I 100% believe you can start your business. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I agree with you. <laughs> so um, there, there's a ton of, of parenting content in the world, right? Like um, it's out there. Um, it it a lot of it in thinking about it doesn't focus on business a lot of it just focuses on the relationship between parents and their children parents and their jobs um what's the what's the ecosystem out there for 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 parent and business content is there, is there a lot of you is there a few of you do you um, know there are there people in it do y'all ever like talk like is it like what's that What's that community look like of of, of of people that are actually producing this and not necessarily just contributing to what you're doing, but have their own entity that they're producing themselves? Yeah, there's 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 a there's a few, um, but a lot of them focus, like I said, on women, um, mumpreneurs, that kind of um, direction but there is a couple that do like parentpreneurs and stuff like that and yeah we all talk we all get along we all collaborate with each other so yeah you know tapping into each other's audiences we follow each other on social media um i've shared their content they've shared my content and things like that so it's it's uh, yeah i wouldn't say it's a um a thing like a comp- well i've never felt it i should say where it's a competitive thing it's all been very very supportive because i guess we're all on the same mission in it we're all going in the same kind of direction you know we want to support each other parents mothers fathers in business so yeah it's very um it's a very yeah a very good community i would say the community that i who gets the most media coverage in contact. sorry Nothing, nothing. That's, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> <You said probably. laughs> What'd you say? 
What did you say? <laughs> I said, well, who gets the most media coverage? And then I was like, oh, oh, I don't know. You know, I've had quite a fair bit though. I've done quite well. I've done quite exactly. Well, yeah. that, that's what I was saying. It's the one who gets the media coverage. It's like, but it's not a competition. And people yeah. are all here to just kind of do the work together. No, but we are. We are. I've not been on TV yet, but yeah. <laughs> um. So so when you um think about like the the future right you said there's some things that you want to do in in 2023 um as it relates to to uh growing and, and pivoting slightly um in the business um how do you see uh the mechanism of 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 content distribution changing, right? There was a period of time where no one liked the magazine, then people did like the magazine. Then there was that weird time frame where like digital magazines tried to mimic flipping pages and then that kind of went away for a bit. And like, so where, how do you see like the evolution of like, um, and now people I think are back to tactile experiences. Like I actually like, folding magazine pages like i like the the touch experience of a magazine um even though five years ago i was like oh that's a dead medium right because yeah. it's kind of online would just take that space over mm -hmm. um there becomes a point where just pages and turning pages increasing pages feels like a really um enjoyable again tactile experience so where do you see the evolution of just magazines and 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 what that might look like in the future well this is a debate that goes on and on and on because a lot of people believe print is dead so from my experience and i can only talk from my experience um digital is very much i get more digital downloads do i than i sell of print copies so sure. that speaks volumes in itself and print is um, digital is a much easier way to reach a wider a global audience because it is available digitally for parents everywhere to download and read um whereas print is a bit more it's, it's not a bit more it's more expensive to produce and it's more expensive for people to purchase as well so where do i see the future i don't know the answer to that um I read a lot about, you know, I read a, a lot of the debates online and articles and stuff about, you know, print and digital. Um, I still buy my print magazines because I love that touchy feeling of kicking back on the sofa with a good old magazine. So, yeah. you know, but I guess we all have different preferences, don't we? So, you know. So interesting. I have a theory on it. I think for me, I think that... Um, Digital feels more consumer driven. Print feels more business to business driven. So like if you get like a bunch of like hospitals, all of those places still have waiting rooms that people are just sitting there looking for something interesting that then will follow up to, I want to build a direct relationship to that person. Um, yeah. I now know, I go into like my dentist office and I'm like, are we still reading this? You have Maxim. I haven't read a Maxim since <laughs> I was 12. Like, right? But yeah. right, like, but I imagine Maxim has a department that is still very much in that kind of B2B space, right? So like yeah. um, I think print has such a, a powerful value in in business spaces, um, specifically kind of the the waiting room reception area and there's tons of them right all over the yeah. world that are just people are just sitting in spaces mm. but then that's changed a bit sorry to cut you that's changed yeah. because since 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 covid and everything you know the surgeries i've been into and the dent my dentists don't have that no more because of you know the that's transmission and everything so yeah no so so for us it, for me at least for for me yeah. Um, uh, they they give it to you. You get like an envelope. It's like it's okay. like it's like yours. Yeah. So they give it to oh. you like, here. Yeah. It's like here. But think about it, right? Like it's like it's like if every time you went to your hair salon, they said, "Um, we will 
give you a free hand massage. Every other place, you don't get a hand massage. If yeah. all things are equal, you're like, I like the place with the hand massage, right? <laughs> and so it's, I think it's one of those things that, especially in a COVID world where um, nobody really wants to be anywhere, what can be the differentiators? It can't be, would you like a water? I don't want anything that's communal in your water, right? So getting like this kind of plastic, zipped sort of magazine choice is a really nice way of being like, here's something to read, it's sterile, and it's yours. It probably cost them three ninety nine. My visit probably cost me <laughs> whatever my visit cost me. Right? Yeah. So it was like a really cool investment on it. Um, on on just on on that small differentiator um, yeah. when you have a choice of X amount, right? Especially here because yeah. I feel like if you don't like, it's funny. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine, and they were like. Uh, if something doesn't exist on their social media feed, then the only time that they know it exists is in billboards and in magazines. And I thought that was interesting because the internet's purpose is exploration, right? You're supposed to yeah. do all of this to explore, but then we also are creatures of habits so we're less likely to introduce new things into things that we already have situated in a way that we enjoy them. Yeah. And so it's like, you know, oh yeah, like I only know that there was a concert because there was a flyer on the floor. And I'm like, interesting. <laughs> interesting, right? Because, because there's an advertisement company that is spending millions to get the concert to you, yeah. but it was a magazine on the floor that did it, right? And so yeah. it'll be very, very interesting, I think, to see how uh, the magazine game plays out. What about advertisement? How has that worked? Have you have you sought out advertisement? Um, um, yeah, I've done um, advertisement like on Facebook, Instagram. Um, I've done Pinterest. Um, that's, yeah, like those three platforms are the only ones I've done advertisements with but for me more it's about getting the magazine um into the hands of you know like it's on Zinio for example and that's a, one of the biggest magazine publish publishers online sort of thing so it's getting it on those kind of platforms where it's reaching the readers who people who go on there to buy a magazine so yeah um and then what about uh internal advertisement like so have you found companies that are like, hey, I want to partner with you. Yeah. Uh, give us some space or give us some opportunity in order for us to to really uh, to talk to our audience. And, and what's your vetting process for like that? Um, well, the vetting process for that is, is, is it goes through me, basically. So it depends. I've had parents who advertise their business in the magazine, yep. which I do kind of give priority more to parents rather than big big brands for example um and i've had um big brands approach me for advertising and, and have advertised in the magazine as well so yeah it really does it really does vary it really does vary from issue to issue because there's only four issues a year okay. so space is limited as well <laughs> but i don't want the magazine to be full of advertisements i want it to be full of value where the reader picks it up and they don't really want to throw it away because oh my god that article that I've just read is going to be useful for me in six months time this has some awesome tips in it that's that's the kind of approach I take with the magazine is to offer value where it is useful practical tips that you can implement into your business or implement into your life so that's the approach I very much take Absolutely, but but I think also when when I mean vetting, like, are you like looking up their Yelp reviews? Are you looking up like? Oh yeah. yeah. What's your vetting process when some? Because I imagine that again to your er, to your point that you made earlier and just now that you are highlighting parents' business, right? But there's there's also some risk there, right? Because you just never know. Yeah. What 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 that looks like. Um, if you're not really being and doing your due diligence around 
learning more about them. So what's that what's that vetting process like? Are you so that vetting process is like yeah, it's going through their websites, it's going through their social media because you can get a, a lot of information about someone and how they conduct their business through their social media and the comments that are left and the reviews that are left as well. Wow. So that's very much my vetting process. As for vetting them as a person, I don't vet them as a person. I'm usually connected with them via LinkedIn as well. So you yeah. can see what kind of connections they have, what kind of content they put out because it is a professional platform after all. So you can get a gist of a person or a business from those kind of aspects. As so well. these are people that, that typically you have relationships, so it's not maybe like just a random email from a random place. It's like, hey. Oh no, I've had those, and I've just been like, you know, I've had you know, betting companies wanting to advertise. I'm like, no, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm not into the gambling or <laughs> that yeah. sort of thing. I've had loan companies as well, and I'm like, no, because I don't want. It depends on the loan company. For example, some of them were kind of shady ones where. I know you're a loan shark almost, and you just want, you know, you're no, you're leading the audience astray. So, yeah, those get a no from me. So, it just really does depend on the type of company, to be quite honest, and what they want to advertise. Betting is a no no, you know, yeah. gambling, no no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you definitely don't want to ruin people's lives. Yeah. No, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> um, and to any loan company or betting company, you may not, you may be enriching people's lives, but <laughs> you also may be ruining them, by the way. Um, so I asked uh, two things of everyone that is on Man vs. Brand. Um, the first, and this is going to be interesting because I'm interested in what you're watching on any streaming platform uh, and or on TV. What's something that you recently watched that you thoroughly enjoyed? Well, I thoroughly enjoyed, um, and it's so bad of me because I'm thinking of the name, but it made me laugh, was the new um, Kevin Hart on Netflix. Oh. oh, okay, got it, got it, got it, got it, got it. The new one, I can't even remember it for the life of me, um, where he's the dad and then the family go away. He was the stay-at-home dad. But yep. anyway, that uh, that... He got slated. I don't know why, but I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, that, made, that made my Friday evening one week when it first came out. So yeah, I, 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 I think he also might. I think he also might be slightly. It's called Me better. Time, isn't it? Me Time. Yeah, it's called Me. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. 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 Um, I think I think also, um, I think Kevin Hart may be a little overexposed. Mm. I think he's just everywhere. And I think sometimes you got to let people miss you for a bit. And so even when things are really good, people, if they're kind of just like, oh, another Kevin Hart movies on Netflix, it be, you, people don't even actually give it the opportunity to be as mm. great as it is because it's consistently um, being shown. Like, what's, what's something else I feel like? It's kind of like Grey's Anatomy. I don't okay. know if you watch Grey's Anatomy. No, I don't watch it. No, no, no. Something. I do watch a lot of American shows as well, like, you know, Scandal, How to Get Away with Murder. They're finished now, but those were my jam. <laughs> so, 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 I'm. Huh, I'm trying to think of a show. That I that that I think is okay. I'll give you a different example of someone who does it really well. Um, yeah. I'm a big Doctor Who fan. Tenet, when uh, he comes out, he comes mm -hmm. out, and people okay. are interested in the work he's gonna do. Yeah, yeah, okay, it's yeah. Like, I assume. Like, it, like it's 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 a treat when it comes out. You're like, yeah. Uh, and 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 yeah, it may not necessarily get the same volume in terms of number of work, but it it, it skyrocks in viewership, mm -hmm. and in a way, you're 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 sold into what the next work is. Yeah. Versus maybe like uh, and God, I, I love her to death, a Melissa McCartney mm -hmm. type person, where every year there's three movies at some point. Yeah. People are just gonna go. 
Yeah, I see what you mean. I see what you mean. No. I do see what I do get what you mean, but yeah, I, I like Kevin Hart and I yeah. No, I like Kevin Hart too. I, I yeah. actually I'm a huge Kevin Hart fan. And I actually like yeah. Anton. I just think that like from a brand perspective, yeah, you can overexpose yourself to the point that people don't that people start to devalue what mm. you do. Social media is a good example, right? There yeah. can be 30 posts, Br Bridget, that you put out um, about um, about parents and biz, and then you might put out one post with your son or your oh, daughter, yeah. and it get, and it yeah. get <laughs> 80 times more oh, 80 <laughs> times more engagement than the rest of the post. People are just so used to seeing it that it's, it's so not true. waiting. And then the moment that you change, and there's this moment of like yeah. value and difference, and like, yeah. oh, this is a treat. I don't see this often. Yeah. It now it's skyrockets in how people feel. And you could take all of the collective 35 posts that you did before, and it still may not equal the number of the one picture yeah. that you had with Very your daughter. Because Very people, true. Yeah, because overexposure is something that people kind of. Because it's just like if I show my face on my Instagram, for example, it does a picture of me, it gets more engagement because it's like, oh gosh, Bridget's like, oh, I haven't seen her. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. yeah. It's exactly. very true. Very true. Yeah. Very good point there. Yeah. yeah. So, so you know, I think that's kind of where that's at. I think, I think the work is so good. I think he's still as funny as he ever was. Um, yeah. I just think that it's so much of it that now. It's kind of giving like a, uh, I don't really know where. Interesting, I don't know if you follow him, but I think um, The Rock, Dwayne Johnson is almost entering that same space yeah. where if you just keep producing stuff at some point, someone's yeah. going to be like, you're, I don't know if you're as funny as I thought you were. Um, even though you are, it's just you see somebody for too much. All right. Enough uh, of that. Uh, oh, yeah. so, no, continue, please. No, I was just going to give the example. It's a bit like um, Denzel Washington. He doesn't put out movies, but when he does that, you're like, I've gone to the cinema to see it. You're like so excited. Yeah, because it's a treat. Yeah. A treat, so, yeah. Right? Like, and he could. Yeah. Like, Denzel's one of those people. He, he's yeah. still a name that could put out a yeah. movie a year, right? And it's going to yeah. do okay. But at some point, you're going to say, oh, that's Denzel being Denzel. Like yeah. it's gonna be the same, you know what I mean? But yeah. but I don't feel he puts out enough. I want more from him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which, which creates demand. Which yes. you know, like yeah. that's what that's what that, I think that's when people cherish you as an artist, right? Where they, 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 yeah. they, they love your artistry. Um, yeah. and it, you know, it's it's. I think it's also you know, kind of bringing it back to entrepreneurship. I think that there's always this weird balance where you want to get out to the public, you want to get out the most that you can. You want to reach them at as many touch points as possible, but you also don't want them to not see you yeah. or the value that you bring. You want them to remember you when it's mm -hmm. time to make a recommendation or a sale. And there's a very thin line between like, oh, I see that every day, you know, it's kind of now just a part of my Instagram feed yeah. versus, yeah. wow, like, I actually do need that. That's a yes. brand that I remember. So it's a balance between the number of times it takes for you to be top of mind and to hold that position and the amount of time that you engage with someone in so much that you become white noise to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That. Yeah. <laughs> Just in case this ever comes back at a later point, I love you, Kevin Hart. I said that <laughs> and I will say it again. And on time was a, uh, uh, or me time was it uh, a, a great uh, movie. Um. All right. So, what's something that you watch any streaming platform, TV, that uh, maybe folks don't know that you enjoy, but that you actually thoroughly do? Oh my gosh. Okay. Um. I like <laughs> I like cheesy stuff as well. So you know, like um, what's it called? Um, it's not called Blind. Uh, Love is Blind. Um, okay. Selling Sunset. So people okay. might not know. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> but I love all of that stuff. <laughs> I binge on that stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. They have like lo love in a boat. Love on an <laughs> island. Uh, love when you can't see each other. It's like, 
um, 90, like 90 Day Fiance. There's all so of many of them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're all great. Um, I don't know if it was on the pod or if it was separate, but but a person and I were discussing how um, reality TV no longer feels real. The traditional ones, the Housewives ones, the the, yeah. the, the those those sort of hallmarks of what reality TV used to look like, it, we now know is scripted in a way because yeah. the individuals now understand the formula to be mm -hmm. successful. So I'm gonna be the villain this year. I'm gonna be apologetic this year. Most yeah. scripted TV, we, it, it's just boring and a lot of it's been regurgitated unless you're just a hit show that has a different premise. Mm -hmm. What they argued was the beautiful thing about like the 90 Day Fiancés is it, they don't quite know the formula yet. So it's all very raw. It's mm -hmm. all very like tears and crying and love and mm -hmm. like, and and kind of transparency and, and just that, that this kind of space of um, almost gamified romance. Yeah, yeah. Um, is such like a, an un, is it unformulated space in the way that the contestants mm. have they haven't gotten the formula down like the love and hip hops or the housewives yeah. have? And so it's pro and, and what they're arguing with, it's probably the the only um, segment of television where you truly don't know the end. Yeah. Like, it's, and that's what makes it exciting for people. People yeah. truly don't know how it's going to end, and so mm -hmm. people looking at it. We're in a lot of these programs. You kind of know it's going to be a reunion show. You know, people are going to be and that's going to be the end. And they were arguing that that the the most interesting non-linear form of television right now is gamified romance, yeah. and that and that a lot of people. That's why a lot of people tune into it. Yeah, no, I agree, and that's why I say it's always important to catch the first series because the first series is the most kind of like authentic yeah yeah after that the next series it's like okay they've watched the first series oh they watched the third you know yeah. so yeah the first series is always the best for me yeah and they're <laughs> turning those out and so it's just it's interesting to see kind of um um what that looks like even i think i watched uh, some recent like big, big brothers I was never a big brother fan but i watched mm. it um and it's interesting in people's exit interviews and the interviews that they do after they left the house, yeah. how unaware they, how, I don't even know if it's unaware, the, how, how much they advocate the differentiation between their behavior in the house and their behavior in real life. It's such mm -hmm. like an interesting idea yeah. that, you that you enter a space, you become a character, you exit the space, and then you want the world at large to respect you for the person that you say you are, not the person that you demonstrated for those 70 mm. years. <laughs> so someone will be like, I'm not racist. And they're like, but here are the 15 racist things that you said while you were on the show. And they're mm. like, but that's not me. It was for the game. And yeah. you're watching it and you're just like, I don't. It, 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 if that's the game you're playing, I don't know if you played the game. <laughs> right? Like, right? Nice. After all of this out the TV, you still have to become a human being, right? Yeah. So people engage with what they saw of you, specifically with reality TV, because yeah. we know that you're, 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 you are, you know, fictionalizing yeah. part of who you are for the purpose of television. But since that's yeah. all we know of you, that's how we are going to engage with you. And so it's it's interesting yeah. to think about these people. You're not actors. We don't believe that this is a role. Yeah. Like, you just think you're an a-hole. And <laughs> sorry, that's what you did, right? Uh, yeah. Anyway. All right. So um, if someone wants to get engaged with your content, if they want to um, to – uh, talk to you about maybe uh, being a contributor um, to what you're moving forward in, in 2023. What's the best way to get in contact with you? The best way to get in contact with me is via the website, um, okay. the Contact Me page. And the website is www.parentsinbiz.co.uk or 
dot com. Okay. Local work. Yeah. <laughs> and That's the best way. And if I wanted to follow you on a social media channel, uh, I want to see what you're posting in, in Parents in Biz on social media. Where am yeah. I going? Um, Parents in Biz. That's B I Z um, on all platforms. So that's Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest. Yeah, YouTube even. So yeah. <laughs> all right, cool. Well, thank you so much, Bridget, for being on the show. We definitely appreciate your time. Thank um, you for having me. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, guys. We covered um um being a um, entrepreneur but but more so you know what does it take to support others and to find your mission in supporting others uh at, at the top of the episode i talked about um the difficulties of parenting and not just parenting as a biological thing but parenting as a communal activity of of raising uh children into adults and so much of that is also about role modeling different behaviors. Um, being an entrepreneur, um, working a traditional nine to five, um, going it out on your own and freelancing, there is such a spectrum of inability to earn in this world. And so you can become a better parent, uh, a better leader, a better guardian by equipping yourself with as much information as possible so that not only is your life benefiting, but you're also creating legacy. Uh, this is Dion Brown. That's Man versus Brand. Thank you for it daily, and uh, we'll talk you. to you soon. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>